Just a man and his will to survive. It's the eye of the tiger. It's Joseph Rand from Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate, Rand Realty. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, really delighted to be here, and I have an unbelievable panel of uh, industry uh, superstars to talk about this debate, uh, indie versus franchise. And we're going to talk about it uh, with some people who have a bunch of very different perspectives on the issue. And I'm going to start by saying, as I walked into the, the hotel today, I ran into a woman named Kendall Young, uh, who I know is a colleague, a friend. And she started, she's been a top real estate agent for years. She just started a brokerage five months ago. And she started it uh, as an independent. And so my first question to Alex Perillo, who runs the Realty Franchise Group, is to say, what's the pitch? What's the pitch to somebody starting a new brokerage to get them to join a franchise? Did you get her card? <laughs> I, I can direct you to her. She's a friend of mine on Facebook. You know, the, the pitch, Joe, really, uh, for someone, and congratulations to her for st starting a company that takes a lot of courage and guts to do that. Uh, but really, it's, it's, when I think about what we do, uh, it's to help people be more successful. So uh, if, if someone's starting a company or is already uh, in a firm right now, they have lots of options. And uh, what I would encourage them to do is explore all of those options. Just decide, uh, you know, where you want to be in the business, where do you want to, you know, how do you want to grow, uh, what, what do you see the company looking like in five years or ten years from now, and then see what your options are out there to, to help you get to where you want to be. And what does a franchisor, very specifically, you know, the elevator pitch, what does a franchisor give to her that she can't do for herself? We help people be successful, and with the scale that we have, with the systems, the tools that we have, we can help a small entrepreneur take their business to the next level. That would be the pitch. Okay. Now, Mauricio, four years ago, you started the agency in Southern California. You've grown it the last two years, over $3 billion of sales. You decided to go independent. Why? Well, you know, the reason for independence is, is you're, you're, you communicate with the neighbor, you know, with your community, um, and, and there's a certain... Uh, opportunity to, to do that, that uh, the larger you are, not necessarily the franchise or not franchise, but also the, 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 how big you are, how you're able to communicate with your, with your agents, uh, with your community, uh, with all of those people. You, the, the agency is an LA-based company, right? Uh, in LA, we have uh, uh, creative agencies, we have uh, UTA, we have CAA. Uh, it's very cool, it's very hip. So there's a, there's, a, there's a connection with the community. And I think that having that uh, as an independent, you have that greater connection. And you don't think you could have done that as part of a franchise group? Well, uh, Look, as part of a franchise, you know, do you lose a little bit of a culture? Do you have a culture? Do you create a culture? We're new. We're starting to, we want to be disruptive in the real estate industry. So, you know, our goal was to come out there and be disruptive, change things. Um, and, and when you carry a legacy, it's harder to make those changes. Um, so, you know, starting from scratch and being independent, I think, gives us that opportunity. Now, we have a different perspective. Dottie Herman, you were a uh, franchise broker in Long Island took an unbelievably bold step about 15 years ago to buy Douglas Elman, a huge Manhattan-based company, uh, brought it into a transition to a franchise, and then since then have, in the last few years, have gone independent with it. What did you get from being a franchise, and what factored into your decision to go independent? Well, let me first say, I think that whether you're a franchise or you're independent, your success is number one, most important, going to be the operator. Okay, so I think if you don't have a good operator, whether they're a franchise or independent, they won't do well. If that you are a good operator, I think you can figure it out. But I, I um, you know, when I bought up with Selman, and we were prudential at the time, I, uh, I didn't tell them. <laughs> there was no franchises in the city, and uh, that would have been a bad thing. And I had like a year and a half to become, you know, they gave me a year and a half to integrate Prudential, so I started putting little rocks around, like in the sixth month, to try to give them the hint. But by that point, you know, we had bonded, and, and, and I think a lot has to do with the operators. So we became Prudential, and then when we paid off our debts, uh, we decided to be independent. Uh, and I think there's, there's, you know, there's pluses and cons on both, but I think that uh, being independent I think your name is something. As I've been a few, when you have a, a franchise name, at the end of the day, you're known with that name. And so if you want to go solo, sometimes that's hard. But I also think if you're with a good franchise, there's a, lot, there's a lot of support and there's a lot of camaraderie. 
So I think there's, you know, pros and cons. We're pretty big, so we always had to have our own marketing people, our own tech people. We, we really had to have our own, so for us... Do you think it's a factor of size that at a certain size a company is able to provide itself with the tools, resources that it doesn't need what it might get from the economies of scale of being part of a franchise? Is that part of it for you? Well, I think that that's part of it. I think also we bought a company that had a 100-year-old name. I mean, it's 105 now. It looks pretty good. It had a few facelifts. So I think <laughs> that... Uh, I, I think that we didn't really need that, the name uh, as much as... But I did... I, I would get people that would call me when we were Prudential and they'd say, you know, uh, like, how do I become Prudential? And I would say to them, I'm not a franchise salesman, so I don't have anything to gain to sell you anything, but I think you have to know how to operate. So I think that's really part of it. I mean, I think, you know, and again, depending on the franchise and the person. So I think with Alex, like as he said, you should really meet the people regardless of the franchise that you are going to be associating with because that makes a difference. Uh, now, Bob Moles, you, uh, chairman of Intero. Intero, you're kind of on all sides of this because Intero is an independent broker. It's also a franchise that has franchise operations throughout the country. And it's now part of the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services uh, network. Uh, not network, but the, the home services uh, which also franchises through Berkshire Hathaway. So you've seen all different angles of this, and you used to work at Realogy. So you've seen the whole spectrum of perspectives on the franchise versus indie debate. What's your feeling? What, what, what's your advice to this woman starting her company? What would you tell well, her? You know, what I think, Joe, is that um, in this business, much of what we do is tell our story. If you're going out on a listing presentation, you're telling a story, right? If you're recruiting a sales associate, you're telling a story. And to a great degree, somewhat amplifying what Dottie said, it's not so much about the story. Intero has a story, Mauricio has a story, Alex's brands have a story. I used to tell Alex's story. <laughs> um, they're all good stories, but what's most important is who's telling the story to what Dottie was saying, the operator. Mm. So um, when I talk to my company, I say, you know, it's here in San Francisco, it's kind of like the Grateful Dead, what a long, strange trip it's been. So the truth of the matter is they all work, and guess what? They all don't work if you don't do it right and the, you have the wrong storyteller. Yeah, so that, that's kind of what Dottie was saying, which is that it really comes down to, and, and we've seen it. I mean, there are operators who can take a franchise and run it into the ground. There are some that can be independent run into the ground. There's people on both sides that can build up amazing companies. Um, but I want to try to get at the, the, the real the, the decision that has to get made. So let me go back to you, Mauricio. Is there something that would drive you? What would be the, if there was a thing that you could get from a franchise system that would make you make that leap from being an independent? What, is there something you can even think of that someone could drive you in? I mean, I'd love to hear it. There's really nothing that I can think of that, that would drive us uh, to ever, you know, become part of a franchise. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the excitement that we did is that we wanted to, you know, disrupt a, a, an industry. Um, I, and, and like Dottie said, you know, her, old, her name, you know, is 105 years old. A lot of these, you know, Sotheby's is, you know, 200 years old. Um, you know, these are all names that, that carry a legacy. Um, and, you know, much like Richard Branson did, you know, in, in the real estate, in, 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 in air industry, um, he changed the experience of flying. Right. Uh, well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the experience of buying and selling real estate by storytelling, uh, by being creative, by being marketing. I think the operations and the systems and everything that you have on the back end are tremendously important, and you can't operate without those things. But I don't think you have to be part of a franchise to have those systems. I think you can create those systems, and if you can create them from scratch um, and, and actually be the creator, there are much better, newer systems that you can go. Um, the larger you are, the more franchises you have, it's more difficult to spread those, you know, the, the the wings, you know, and to spread the span um, and the communication to all of your different franchisees and 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 and, and people that you know that work for you. So, from our perspective, you know, we're we're so just locked excited. In. I'm locked in. We're excited. We want to grow. We want to keep it going. So, but Alex, you, you never give up on a prospect. So, never. my question would be, what uh, what is your pitch to some, you know either of these two people who run two enormous companies in urban environments? What's the What's the pitch? What's the, you know, how do you get them across the line? How do you draw them into a meeting? How do you, how do you uh, get them to adopt a franchise model? Well, you know, 
everybody's different, Joe. Uh, you know, every broker is different, every agent out there is different, and it has to work for the individual. Franchising doesn't work for everyone, um, but it works for a number of people. If you look at like the real trends, top 500 companies, if you go through that list, these are companies that do from 1,500 transactions to 350,000 transactions to be on that list. 75% of them are with the franchise brand. So they, and they choose to, to do that, and it's working for them. If you look at the uh, uh, Real Trends top 1,500 agents, um, agents and teams, they divide it into six categories. 65% of the agents on, those, uh, on that list are with the franchise. So that's working for them. I mean, my advice, because since everyone is different, is, is do your due diligence. Look at what your options are. If I was trying to make the decision, I'd call some of the people on that list and say, what do you like and what don't you like about what you're doing, both broker and agent, and, and, and not just take people's opinions, but actually talk to people and do some due diligence and then decide which way you want to go. Oh. Uh, let me throw, yeah, Dottie. Well, I just want to say one of the things that, and I, and I agree with Alex, but one of the limitations we had being a franchise was we were limited to where we could grow, and I know you know that on your own from being we part of We were both a franchise. prudential franchisees together. Yeah. Um, if you want to grow, a lot of times franchises have specific territories, and you can't go to another territory because you, uh, somebody else has it. So with that, it does limit you if you do want to grow. Unless, so that's something you would have to like, work out ahead of time. Uh, so that was another... Uh, the the limitations question. on geography that you might have conflicts with existing franchisees and, also, and whatnot. I think it's fair to say there's a difference with being a franchise name, like affiliating with a franchise and owning your own, and company-owned franchises. Because basically, when, even when I was a franchise, I really did my own thing. I didn't have... The franchise really doesn't tell you what to do. Um, you can use their resources, but they don't really bug you, other than if you go out of the territory or you probably uh, don't use their name properly. But I think that, you know, you, it was for me a, limiting our freedom, and I think that the culture is going to be great, whether I think you're a franchise or not, if you have a good operator. Now, Bob, you, she mentioned about the geographic conflicts that you can sometimes get. You guys have been building Intero as a franchise operation and, but it's, you know, you, you build it from scratch. It didn't exist. You didn't have those existing legacy issues that they might have with a mature franchise operation like what Alex has been running with now many our, of his our brands. Our core business, Joe, is the residential real estate business in Silicon Valley. So, you know, our offices are big. We have about 150 people in each one of those 14 offices. And we have a certain culture that some people are attracted to. And our way of franchising was just to kind of recruit by attraction. If they wanted what we did in terms of the way we built that company, then we would do it, and, and that's what's happened. But we don't open franchises in our own territory. Mm -hmm. So you do maintain certain geographic uh, spread for, so they don't have those conflicts? Much of our culture centers around being a coaching type company. So what we do is we share our name, and we share what we've done in order to grow you know, a top 20 real estate company with other people who want to, using Alex's term, want to be successful and grow. Now, for, for those of you, uh, Dottie, Mauricio, the, you're saying the franchise model, it worked for you for a period of time. You're not in it now. You started out. You didn't go into it. Um, going back to what I started with, talking to somebody, and it could be Kendall, it could be anyone else here who's thinking of starting a company, doesn't have kind of the vast, I mean, $3 billion in two years is not really a small little startup. That's something uh, extraordinary. So someone's starting, and they're really starting you know, a couple of people in one office, and they're, they're starting from scratch. And I would think that one of the real appeals of a franchise system is that you get, you get a box, a business in a box that you can, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you don't have to, to decide, you know, things are done for you and decided for you. Can you see in those circumstances the advantage for somebody doing a startup in those circumstances? Uh, without question, I, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody in the hallway yesterday and uh, they were an independently owned uh, um, 
a company, they went franchise, and I asked them what was the advantages for you going franchise, and you know, what they said was that their advantages was that they, in essence, got you know, the systems, uh, the support, the back end, and all of those things, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're unable to deliver on those things, then you, you know, franchising might be a great thing for you. Um, if you are able to live, deliver on, on, on those things, um, then, you know, and, and you can be independent, and you can have your own, you know, we're, we're talking about culture, we're talking about all of those things, and, you know, the agency culture, you know, we have, is defined, and, and the big question is how do you actually define, you know, the culture, you know, and, 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 and we like to have fun, so our culture is simple, okay, the agency culture, no assholes, and we like to have fun, it's that simple. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Uh, in my company, we adopted one of those, but I can't tell you which one. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Dottie, you're talking to this broker, started out, you started out, when you started your company, you went franchised with Prudential. Um, no, I, I, what, I, I didn't pick that. I mean, it, it, would, it worked out very well, but we, I was Merrill Lynch, and uh, they sold to Prudential, which I was really upset about. I was like, I don't like that name. Merrill, in the days of the 80s, they ruled. Uh, however, I was really very fortunate that Prudential allowed me the money. I mean, they financed all of my growth. So from that point, I would not be sitting here without them. So they really did for me. I didn't care what they delivered to me as far as services. They lent me the money to open in Long Island initially and then in the city. So... Uh, you know, those and that's days. one of the, that is one of the, so having that, a big pocket and I would partner. Say, you know, yeah, so I was very loyal to them because I am a loyal person and they really put me in business. Uh, they believed in me. So uh, I didn't care about the services. Right now, I, I just think that, again, if you're a small broker, if you're not intent, if you're involved in your community, if you're very involved and you want to stay a certain size and people know who you are, then you could do independent. But if you're not, then I think you probably want to have a name that people have heard of. Oh, let me go back. Oh, you had something. As, as, as a broker, I think that our job uh, and, and our responsibility to the agents is to create an environment that they can have fun in, excel in, um, give you know tremendous amount of tools to real estate agents so that they can actually go out and be the best that they can be and that's really what our job as real estate brokers and owners should be um, and, and, and then you know to give back to the community okay yeah so go ahead. just one point I, I think there's a misconception at least I'm speaking from the franchise group and our brands there's a misconception out there that if you franchise that you lose control of your business, you lose your independence. And, and it couldn't be further from the truth. When you look at a franchise agreement, uh, there's a lot of you know, terminology about what you can do with the marks and the obligations of both parties. But when you're in a franchise, there's no one, or at least one of our brands, there's no one telling you who you can hire, how much you pay them, uh, what agent splits you have, what your policy is on referrals, and even what your business model is. So we convert companies to our brands that need and want what we have, and then we let them run their companies, and they get the advantage of using what they need and what makes sense, but their culture is their own. We don't try to change the culture, and that's what makes us successful. 99% of the brokers stay with us, so, um, you know, that's our, that's our measure. We're out of time. I want to give Bob Moles one last quick question. What's the, what's the one piece, concrete advice you give to somebody starting up their own brokerage? You've been on all sides of this. What's the one thing you would tell them? I would say have a good story. Have a good story. All right. Can I hey. offer a perspective? Hello, I'm out here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm here. Oh, it's the voice. I thought I was having an aneurysm, and there were voices in my oh. head. Yeah. Not the first time I've heard those, by the way. But yeah, all right, we're out of time, so quick, quick question. Okay, I'm Jim Smith. I'm from Golden, Colorado. I own a 10-person brokerage, which does about $35 million a year, 100 transactions, 100 sides. And we are a perfect target for being recruited. I seriously considered Keller Williams. I uh, went to one of their mega camps, super impressed. I love them. Whenever somebody says they want to go into real estate, I say go to Keller Williams. Come to us <laughs> after you've been trained. Okay, this is... No. And that happens, by the way. But uh, I used to tell them to go to Coldwell Banker because they have great training too. Now I tell them about both. But the point is this. It, let's look... At, you haven't really talked about the dollars and cents. I make 100% on my own volume and I'm a top producer in my brokerage. I make 15% plus a transaction fee on their work. 
Mm -hmm. And it was unattractive to them and it was super unattractive to me to say, okay, I'll start getting 65% of my commission on my own work and so will they. And like they didn't see the value of it. Also, I told you the name of my company is Golden Real Estate, I think I did. Real estate is local. We have a local brand. I wasn't going to give up that brand to be Keller Williams Advantage or something. All right, so let me, let me, let me just clarify because we're out of time, so I just want to re throw it at the, at the panel. Uh, Alex, the money issue. There's a franchise fee attached to any franchise system. Obviously, you have to, dollars and cents, it has to make sense from a the, dollar perspective. The dollars do. and cents have to work. What you need to do is look at what you're doing now, the systems, the tools, the training, the technology, all of those things that you need to provide to those 10 agents that you have, and then you compare that and the cost of that to what the franchise fee would cost, and then make the decision at that point. If it makes economic sense, great. That's how you would justify well, um, you know, that part of it. All right, I would, love to have a, I would love to be up here for another half hour with this amazing panel. Please, a round of applause, uh, but we gotta move on. Thank you.